right, we're going to have a quick look at a back off programming suite, TwinCat 3. Um, I think this particular programming suite works pretty well for me. I'm not super familiar with it, but for the reasons outlined in the first video, uh, free to use, free to download, um, free short term simulation on your local machine with no hardware, this works really well. So bear with me as I muddle, muddle a little bit because I'm not, this isn't my everyday uh, choice. Nor is programming a PLC for the, for the record, it's not my everyday um, job. So let's have a quick look. We want to make a, um, um, a finite state machine that we can reuse for other things. So with that in mind, we're going to make sort of a, a modular approach one. We're not going to make it super specific to our problem, but we're also not going to make it so general that it's massively complicated for every problem. So uh, program organizational unit, let's call it simple FSM. Or FSM. It's going to be a function block. It's not going to extend anything else. We're going to write it in the ladder logic. Um, you could write it in any language. Uh, finite state machine, for example, once it's fully finished, it's largely a black box. Or if you use it in multiple places on a site, for example, once it's established that it works and it's fully commissioned and tested, um, it's largely magic. The diagnose, diagnostician's not going to need to know how it works inside the box. They just need to know things coming in and out of it are correct. Um, but that logic is the preferred language of most large organizations. So let's go with that. So up the top here, we've got input variables, output variables, and local variables. Um, we're going to need a few of each. Um, we're also going to need to call an instance of our finite state machine from the main routine, the main loop. And we've got a couple of global variables for the desired state number we want to move to and, the, um, and an alarm bit that says, you know, something's gone wrong. So we should start off with by saying if the or we need a we need a, a desired step that we're moving to and the current step and the previous step. So let's say we've got some inputs. We want we want to have uh, we want input um, desired desired step. That's going to be a dint. Uh, we're going to pass in um, alarm active. Boolean. We're probably not going to use that right away. Um, we're going to output some information as well. Let me say out. Um, let's be consistent with our capitalization here. Output um, previous step. It's going to be a dint as well. Out current step. It's going to be a dint. Um, and we're going to need some local internal variables as well. So if we were to look at this now by plonking it on our main routine, put an empty rung in there. We are going to create an empty rung and it's going to be an instance of simple FSM. Okay, and we've got input a desired step. Um, let's let's call this instance uh, simple FSM dish dish washer. First dishwasher state machine. Okay, um, we're going to map our our, um, our global variable as an input into here. So let's just drill through this. This will be different on all of the PLC software. Um, so we've got a desired state coming from our global variable, and let's map our any alarm active from the global variable. Excellent. Let's move, let's add a folder for a group organization and we're going to say state machine. And move our state machine into there to keep things tidy. And later on, we're going to create our input mapping, our process, which will be the main loop, and our, um, or sorry, well, our process routine and a mapping output routine like we talked about in the Visio document. Um, but for the time being, we'll just leave the main routine there because this is going to be way more, way simpler than, than a final um, implementation. So we can delete this because we're not mapping our current step anywhere. So right now, what we've got is an instance variable that holds the data for an instance of our finite state machine. The machine does nothing at this point because the code is empty. But we can save that and drill into the code by double clicking. So let's have a little think about what we want to do. If the person enters a new state or the, the process needs to move from state one to state two. Uh, we don't want it to keep moving a two every time because 
there would A be no point and B it won't work with our previous state concept where if we write it once and we write it again and again and again previous state the second time around will represent whatever the, the state that we move to is and, and it will continue to do that. So it's not very helpful. So what we need to do is do the equivalent of a one shot or a single trigger. So what I would do is say, firstly, we're not going to do any of this stuff if there are alarms active. So we're going to say if, or the equivalent of an if, um, don't fall into the habit of thinking of if else and while and things like that. It's a bad habit I have. Um, PLC logic is not uh, the same as a normal program and a normal programming language. Try not to think if else kind of thing, but we have a tendency to speak like that if you've programmed other languages long enough. But we're going to say, while there is no alarm active, we want to see if the current step number is different from the one being requested. So we're going to need a not equal to operator. We're going to say if the desired step coming in is not equal to the current step, oops, the current step, we want to move the current step to previous and then move the desired one to the, new, to the current one. So we're going to need a couple of different operations here. First, we only want to do this the one time. So we need to do the equivalent of an Alan Bradley one shot or a Siemens one shot. Um, it's called a rising trigger in, in this particular tool. So we've got a rising trigger. It's an instance, a local one. Um, so we call it trigger zero. So we've got here it says, while no alarm, if the desired step is not equal to the current step, one time, we're going to do a couple of move instructions. We're going to move, firstly, the current step to the previous step. So we know what we did last time. Now we're going to move the desired step into the current step. We want to do, sorry, little bugs in my shed. Um, we want to do something that says, in the case of our dishwasher, we've got five or six or seven steps that we want to do. We don't want to go too far with our steps. We want to have some mechanism that says, okay, we're done. So we think of a, an arbitrary top number. Personally, I, I use, say, if I think there's going to be more than 10 steps, I'll use um, 0 to 99. I'll use 99 as the faulted step. In this case, we'll have very few steps. So we we'll use 0 through 9. Um, nine will be our, our fault at our warning step. So we want a mechanism that says if there's some kind of alarm at any point, we don't want to do what we just did. We want to do something a little bit different. So what we might want to do is do a contact that says while well, there is an alarm, we want to have another rising trigger because we only want to do this once. We're not going to use the same trigger, we're going to use a different one. So it becomes trigger one. It's going to be a local instance. We're going to move the current step to previous, but instead of moving the desired step to current step, we're going to take a copy of this, but we're going to move it to step nine, which is going to be our warning step, uh, our alarm step. And then the last thing we're going to do for the moment is say, if at any point our um, If at any point our desired step or our active step gets too large, we want to bring it back to, to another number. So we're going to say if our output step, our current step ever gets larger than or equal to 10, we want to move to the faulted step. So if we tried to go too far, we would move a nine to the output step. So in effect, what this does means, if we tried to move beyond the available number of steps, that would be an uncontrolled situation. That's an error. So I would say we want to cap this manually. So what happens now if we look at this, this whole subroutine in one, in one overview? While there are no alarms, if the next step is not the same as the current step, we're going to one time only set up a previous and then move on. 
If there is an alarm, we're going to ignore that functionality and we're going to jump straight to step nine and we're going to say, this is bad, we don't want to do something uncontrolled. So now we're going to handle alarms somewhere else. Um, if we ever go beyond the space that we're supposed to be in, we pull that back and we say that's, that's an alarm as well. So if we now close that, we have this mechanism here that we've got on the screen where we've got an instance of the state machine. We're going to pass in, there's no alarm because that's not turned on in, in the global variable list. And the desired state number is probably zero. We're not doing anything with this data. So let's go throw this into the PLC and have a quick look through exactly what's going on. Okay, so desired state number was an 11 from something I did a little bit earlier. Um, and that automatically throws us from the starting step of zero because we just created the state machine. Um, takes us from the zero that we were on to straight defaulted, straight to step nine. So if we go to our global variable list, open that up, we've got a desire for an 11 and no alarms turned on. Let's grab this and pin it to the top of our screen so we can see everything at once. Okay, so if we now set this to a prepared value of zero, and we write to it, this is in effect what would happen um, I don't know why we're still in current. Oh, because I didn't hit the right button. So we've got an 11, we jump to, to 9. Um, if we go 3 and we write it, looks like it's still not working. All right, let's, um, let's have a quick look. Maybe it's because we need to update the parameters. Uh, this could be a, an artifact of me having some old data in this simulated PLC. Uh, let's try that. We've got three, three, nine. We're online. There's an out previous step, out current step. Let's have a look in our logic. Out previous step. So it looks like. Um, we're not in alarm. We have a difference between these two. We have not moved. Hmm. Interesting. Let's just reactivate the configuration and restart the PLC process. There could be something a bit wonky going on because of my live demonstration. That looks a bit better. Okay, so we've got all zeros. Let's go back to our main program. So this is where you would start from. Sorry, there was a there was some legacy um, memory values trapped from earlier. So in this case, we've got no alarm on and we've got a value of zero. So if we now push a value of one to the PLC, we will get a previous of zero and a current of one, like this. If we now move that to a two, and we write that, we'll go previous one, current two, like that. So this is how we step through. If we were at any point to end up with an alarm, we would automatically jump to step nine, current step nine, previous two. This means that we have skipped over the, the sequential nature or the, or the programmed steps and gone straight to the alarm step. This is how you would, uh, you would handle um, having alarms that, that don't fall into the normal sequence of events. And it's also, in some ways, how we handle this process. So we can jump from pre-start, running or completed straight into the alarm section by just jumping to that ninth step. So if, we do, if we turn off all these forces when we disconnect, unforce. Okay, let's have a quick think about how would you handle the concept of um, having, say, two machines. If you've got, if you've got a dishwasher and a dryer, let's let's have a look at how you would do that. Um, the simple way is, in fact, you would reuse this um, this concept of a finite state machine. So we could we could reuse the desired state number, or we could add one to it, or something, and, and make it work sort of out of sequence a little bit. But the concept will become clear enough anyway. So what we can do is we can take a copy of of this and we can and we can paste it on this run 
and we can give it a new instance dishwasher dish dryer. It's going to be a local instance of that type. So now we have two different versions of the finite state machine um, in memory and we're passing in the same alarm and the same desired state number. We could use two different ones. In fact, let's, let's do that. Let's add desired state number for dish and same again for, sorry, for dryer and washer. So wash, dry. So we have two of them now. We're going to pass in the washing version to the washer. And we're going to pass in the dryer version to the dryer. And in fact, we're going to change that a little bit because that's trying to use local variables, not ones that I just created here in the global variable table. So let's just uh, point those to the correct ones. So the washer. So you have the prefix on there. Dryer. Save. Do an online edit. And now we should have the new one starts at zero, jumps straight to nine because the alarm is active. So we'll turn the alarm off and now we should be able to pass in a one and a two. Write right, those. So we've gone from zero to two, zero to one, and now we can go three. Right. This one jumps to, from one to three. This one will jump from two to four. We'll put a four in here. And we write it. So this is how you would maintain two separate machines. Um, and you could link them together and say when when the first finite state machine is outputting a step of four, then make the step number of, of the next one increment. Let's have a quick look at how that might work. So now instead of taking this global variable, we're going to say we're going to take the dishwasher output current step and pass it into the dryer. So now these should be in lockstep with each other. One will change, then the next will change. Okay, so we pass in a four to this one. This one moves to a current step of four. This four output from the dishwasher is then passed into the dryer, which moved from three to four. So now if we take the washer and we say we want to move to seven, watch on the screen, bam, we go from four to seven, four to seven. So that's how you can lock the two machines together. Obviously, they don't have to have the same value. Uh, the two machines may be asynchronous and do different things. But this is a concept of how you can control the state of, of multiple machines without writing lots and lots of logic. So let's unforce all of those. Um, before we go super further into it, I'll delete the, dish, um, the first one. The concept of having a state number of 1, 2, 3, 4 is not ideal. You might want to pass in um, say the names of the states. So a good way to do that is going to be if we open up our global variables and we'll switch to the other view because I don't remember exactly how to do this. We're going to add a variable and it's going to be of a special type or a different type. So we're going to call this um, washer states and it's going to be an array going to be an array of 0 to 9 base type of string. Oops, standard types string. And what we're going to do here, once we've saved, is I'm going to go back to trying to find where I can look at Oh, in fact, maybe what I should do is in the main routine, I'm going to make another routine. This is going to be, uh, this is going to be another function block in ladder. It's going to be map states. So in here, inside map states, 
into this screen so we can read it properly. What I'm going to do is say move move a string and it's going to be say idle to global variable washer states to washer state zero. Can I move that? Move idle to state zero. Let's create a couple more states. Idle start. No, 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 say pre-start. Pre-start. Running. And halted. Some of you will be able to see what I'm planning here. State number one, pre start. State number two is going to be running. And state number nine is going to be faulted. So let's go back to our finite state machine. I'm going to pass in an array of strings. Let's go back here and say input variables. It's going to be an array of strings and we're just going to call it states. State. Uh, let's prefix it with in to be consistent in state. State description. And we're going to output one string with the current state. So we make two strings. Let's go out. Yes, description. Script history. Out current description is going to be a string as well. Alright. <clears throat> let's add another couple of runs down the bottom here. Or let's have two runs. Uh, one run. Now we're going to say we want to move the whole run, we just want to move. So what we want to do is actually I'm not directly, we want to make sure it's actually correct. We want to move the internal value. state description, but I don't want to move all of them. I just want to move one of them, but I don't want to move one that I pre-labeled. I want to move the previous step numbered version. So I'm going to put this in the clipboard because it's a dint. I may have to convert it to an int. No. So we're going to move that, the value of that location to the previous description. So what's going to happen now is we're going to move the description out of one into the next. It's going to copy this and instead of doing previous step, let's do current step. Not current step. We don't want to move that to previous description, we're going to move that to current description. Okay. So the good news is now that when we do this, we're going to have an error, I would imagine. No, it actually worked. I was expecting the error here that we need to actually pass in some states. Let's pass in that array of states. Washer states. Now, if you can guess ahead a few steps, you can imagine what I'm going to do with these strings. to delete their mapping because we don't care what they're mapping to, we're just going to look at them for the time being. We go save. Okay, so let's have a little look at our washer states array. Because 
we've got no values in it. What we need to do is go into our main routine here, and we need to call the routine that maps the states. And so what we need to do is go like this. So we need to go offline. We'll do an online change, but for the time being, we'll just do it. What we will do is call map states. Map states. Call the instance of map states. That should write our values. So now if we look at washer states, we have idle pre-start running and faulted. Now we have a step number of four and seven. Neither of those have anything. Number seven is empty. So what would happen if we wrote in here and then we push that value? So the current step has a description of test. So the good news here is that we can do some relatively interesting things. We could make it a second instance of um, the washer states for drier states, give them different names, pass them in the same way, and then our two state machines could have states one through or zero through nine, but they'd have different names and it'd be much easier to debug. Good thing about doing this is it means that if you mapped the current step description and the previous step description straight through to your HMI and your SCADA system, you don't have to do a conversion between integers and a string. So you don't have to write a case statement in your SCADA and in your HMI that says if the previous step is a four, that equates to you know pre-start or whatever the, whatever it is. That means you can reuse this code much more quickly. You can create templates in your HMI that use these finite state machines faster and you don't have to do that mapping of tag um, numbers to descriptions um, in both your HMI, your SCADA and the PLC. Just do them in one spot, much, much quicker. So if we close our global variables for a second and we go back to, and we minimize this bit, we minimize this for the bit, and we go back up here and this time let's jump to state nine by triggering an alarm. Yeah. And we write that, bang, faulted. So we could we can then see we were in step four, which didn't have a description, and we jumped to faulted. So if we made step four with a description, you'd be able to see what the description was. And you can also see, because I have um, washer states, I could create another copy of this called drier states, slightly different descriptions, pass them in, in exactly the same way, and the functionality will work the same. So this is a great way of minimizing the amount of time you have to reuse the same code, you decide you want a more complicated state machine, very easy to extend. This is a great way to, uh, to get started with that concept. So the next time around, what we'll do is we'll write some structure around here where we read some, some imaginary tags in, some of which will be simulated tags. Um, and by simulated, I mean, we will also write a little simulator in the back end to count, for example. So when we press the start button on the dishwasher and nothing happens for 30 seconds, then, then we'll go you know, into a faulted state, for example. So we'll write some code that, that simulates time passing or simulates a water level falling or rising or you know, a few things like that to, to, to imagine that we have a real process plugged into our PLC, real, real physical equipment. But for the time being, finite state machines are um, a good way of dealing with simple standalone machines that give you a really robust and fast way to, to diagnose problems. We will write up the, um, the code that allows you to run this state machine. Um, so for example, in our previous, in our Visio thing, we have here idle mode selection pre-start. So we're gonna write some code that says, if we're in state zero, if we're idle, and somebody presses button one, two, or three, we map those to a variable, and then we move on to step two, because we've moved, moved, moved past mode selection. And then step two to three will be when somebody presses the start button. And then three to four will be when a certain amount of time elapses or the the um, dishwasher verifies that it's empty. So we'll go through how to do that in the next video. So I hope that's been really helpful. Um, let me know what else you want to see.